You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. On today's show, we'll discuss how Nigeria can position its digital economy for the future. As always, you can join today's conversation with the hashtag Beyond Market. You can send your thoughts, your comments to my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awuni. Now, there is no doubt that the digital economy opens up immense opportunities. But how is Nigeria positioned to take advantage of today's connected world and the future? Larry Oshibona, Senior Special Assistant to Nigeria's President on ICT, joins me now for today's discussion. Thank you, Larry. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Good morning. I wanted to just, just, just to lay the, the foundation, the groundwork. Uh, when you see how ICT, I mean, the digital economy, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, how it's all changing the way we work, the way we live, and all of that. I mean, and you just look at how it's also changing that for us here on the African continent. Mm -hmm. How are you interpreting that? Uh, thank you. I think uh, just for the benefit of the, of the viewers, I think it's also important to understand what the concept of digital economy is all about. It's very much a connected sector, digitally connected. It's a knowledge economy that's looking at uh, taking advantage of uh, a whole new working environment. So looking at the benefits of mobility or mobile technology has brought about. So you're looking at new skills. You're looking at the big data that's grown as a result. You're looking at the availability of connectivity uh, across. Again, this brings opportunities for inclusion across uh, the space. Uh, if you look at the fact that digital finance, because to be able to participate within such an economy, you need to have access to finance. And um, more so, it's just the adoption of the enablers. So you're looking at devices, ability to use devices. So the opportunity is not just from the fact that you're a developer, but it's also can you actually use mm -hmm. the solution? Because both all needs to work in, in harmony. So that's really the concept of this digital economy. And it's a whole new opportunity for us, especially in Africa, for a number of reasons. One, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. You know, we've missed out in the fourth, the second, and the third. I think. The opportunity partly is because of the youthfulness of the population of Africa and of Nigeria. Um, if you think about the fact that uh, above 91%, I believe, is uh, uh, younger, uh, below 51 years old, uh, our populace, yes. uh -huh. and majority in the 18 to 35 year olds. So the, the, it's an immense opportunity. When I tend to describe it, I say to people, look at the football age. You know, the football age is uh, 16 to early 30s. Okay. It's the same if you're going to look at the kind of people that will participate in the whole new economy, in creativity, in innovation, uh, because it's really highly demanding. There's been fears that digital economy might create lots of jobs. Indeed, automation will create lots of jobs. But what we must never forget is that here, there are human beings that are creating these automations. Okay. There are human beings that were involved in the old data uh, the program, analysis. Obviously, the programming it, process. Anyway, absolutely. So. Data analytics, you know, creativity. Um, and again, what puts us in a very good advantage is if you look at a lot of the developed economies, the number of youthful populace is reducing. Even China is beginning to start having that conversation. So we have a leverage that we can play on, but it means we must invest heavily in the digital infrastructure, oh. invest heavily in skills acquisition. We need to look at the new work. What does new work mean in the future in the digital world? And we can speak to that a lot more. Mm. Uh, oh, definitely. We'll, we'll just, just table that. Just let's take a few steps back and talk about how we're laying the groundwork for that to happen, especially on the part of the government. The government obviously creates the enabling environment, but you know brings in uh, the environment that is conducive enough to bring in those ne much needed investments. We talk about broadband penetration. I mean, last we heard from the NCC, we're currently at what, 30, somewhere around 31, 33%. We're aiming to go to somewhere 70% by 2023 or 24 or something like that. But I'm just wondering, uh, at the pace at which we're going, because many times what happens is we, you see African continents, the, Af the continent as a whole, playing catch up. But luckily for us, technology can help us leapfrog. Indeed. Because we know where is we, because the technology is Absolutely. thankfully for, for that. But I'm just wondering, the kind of, what, what is the groundwork that we're laying? How much investment are we putting in to ensure that we have broadband penetration to enable you know, the foundation to be strong in the first place so we can begin to build on the rest of it? Indeed. I think we mustn't, um, you know, we always talk about the leapfrog, but we mustn't get complacent about leapfrogging. We must put in the hard work. And what we're doing actually as a government is um, we're putting a heavy investment, private sector driven, 
this conversation that's already started looking at investing in what is 4G plus uh, connectivity uh, uh, that allows, uh, we're looking at something called wireless open access network that allows for ubiquitous coverage across the country. That conversation is already ongoing. There's interest okay. that's already shown uh, from the likes of IFC and World Bank that will drive the private sector consortium. So we're looking at a whole new way of putting real money. And again, you know, we must take advantage of the cheap money for digital infrastructure that's available today in the world for us to invest now uh, the direct opportunities in terms of for every dollar i think there's a 20 dollar return on investment but that is even just in the initial investment if you think about the indirect opportunities that will be created as a result of a whole new approach in which will deliver education a whole new approach if you look at the entertainment industry today it is challenged heavily by being able to distribute distribution so all these will be opportunities that, you know, the likes of Netflix, you will have opportunity mm. for Nigerians to be able to own a light of Netflix because content will, is already created today. You, you look at music, if you look at the Nollywood and code, there's content, but there's much more content that will come as a result. If you look at what is happening in areas for e-commerce, if you look at Lagos, then but joining businesses on, on the back of e-commerce. Imagine we could spread that across the country. So inclusivity, inclusion, spreading out access to finance, uh, you know, we can talk about access to finance until the invest, investment in connectivity is in place. We, we really can achieve that. We're already, as a country, investing heavily in digital uh, identity. What that brings about is now access to services, is now opportunity for private sectors, which you can see again, um, offering credit, credits to businesses, offering credits, cheap credits, okay. to, uh, and instant credits, non-collateralized credits too. So again, we need to scale this. How do we even allow for the startups that are in the burgeoning startup ecosystem in Nigeria? How do they scale? That should be our next conversation. How do they scale? How do they really become uh, the unicorns that we like them to be? And they can be those unicorns. Just focus on the African market. ACFTA has allowed an opportunity for us to start thinking about that. But we must put in our investment. We need to start looking at policies. And again, we can speak to some of those. I mean, for, for, for policies, I'm just trying to get a sense of how important, because we are on a diversification drive. Indeed. Although there might, it, might appear, it would appear that there is a good focus on agriculture for good reasons, I suppose. It's labor intensive. But the ICT sector is proven to be you know, a formidable one that cannot be ignored. I think, I mean, just trying to think back to the Q2 from uh, figures from MBS, I think about 15% of GDP or something like that, even higher than Con the oil sector. And so, you know, yes. obviously, so there's potential. Yes. Yes. So I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense of how strong the policy is. I mean, and what the policy says about how important ICT, developing ICT is for the government and, of course, the country as a whole. Indeed. I mean, you, you, as you rightly said, if you look at from a very low base of investment mm -hmm. and you can see the impact to GDP, so we fully understand, we recognize this, and you just need to listen to the Honorable Minister of uh, Communications, uh, Dr. Issa Pantami. His focus is very much on the e-government. That's his focus, which is extremely important, because government holds a huge amount of data, data that will enable many businesses to actually create solutions for, enables for ease of doing business. If you look at the, the, the success just from uh, BVN and uh, what we have with IPs, 80,000 ghost workers as a result were able to be flushed out of the system. 40,000 people that were collecting multiple salaries. So if you look at the savings as a result of that, and that's why, again, we, is, is, which I totally support is, is, uh, is a direction and a focus on pushing for fully digitized government. Mm -hmm. That's one. Already, you know, look at the Honorable Minister of Trade and Investment, recognizes the role of technology of digital economy, is already speaking on conversations now around how do we build a whole new industry in that space? How do we facilitate trade? How do we, because one of the things that will come about that, which is why I'm, I'm really happy about what the Minister, Honorable Minister of Communications and Otumba uh, Ni Adebayo, Honorable Minister of um, Trade and Investment, the fact that the thinking is very similar because as we go and invest heavily in digitalizing government, mm -hmm. what we must also look at is how do we creates an opportunity for an innovation ecosystem to come out as a result. How do we ensure that the Nigerians are able to participate and start growing these new, all new startups? Giving them, because I spoke earlier about how do we scale. It's how do we connect them to markets. Okay. Government is in the best place position to observe this kind of, let me say, level of risk 
you know, it's very difficult for a startup. It's one of those things where people say, do you know how many years experience have you got if you're looking for a job? But until you get that job, you're never going to get the experience. So now what I'm saying is, as we digitize government, what the areas we're looking at is we want to deliberately, and I think Executive 005, uh, Order 005 okay. speaks to that, look at content. We want to ensure that Nigerian startups that meet the set criteria for uh, participation will be involved in building solutions for Nigeria. Okay, if I could just quickly just uh, slip this in. Speaking about innovation startups, uh, the uh, National Information Technology Development Agency, NIDA, yeah. also just, you know, for Q2, rolled out five new regulations. Now, of particular interest for this conversation is in Nigeria ICT innovation and entrepreneurship vision and the guidelines for ICT adoption in tertiary institutions. Just to give us a sense of, I mean, for this, this the third one, ICT innovation and entrepreneurship vision, what is that about? And no, how does that help? Absolutely. Again, um, you talked about our contribution to GDP from the ICT sector. Just need to look at companies uh, in India. If you look at what the outsourcing market has contributed to the GDP. So we fully understand we must focus on this whole new space for the purpose of outsourcing real skills. I mean, we've already showcased that Nigerians have the skills. If you think about the number of people that go abroad, they go abroad because of the knowledge, especially in, in the technology space. So now how do we bring that market opportunity back to Nigeria? So having innovation hubs, supporting those innovation hubs, not necessarily the government itself has to build these innovation hubs, it's to support the private sector. Like connecting, okay, co okay. So connecting the innovation hubs from, re from researches that are done into incubation phase into uh, concept development from a commercial perspective, which is why I said to you, if you look at the ideas we digitize government, we will deliberately ensure that startups participate. So startups that will come out of a lot of these innovations, the ideas will be taken into consideration for solutions into government. They will be allowed to build solutions on the back of the larger enterprise, which then also extends them an opportunity into other markets. So. We so from a get policy and regulatory framework correct. side of things, you, you think we're, I mean, we have it solid. It's, it's, we it's, it's we a have a solid, solid, solid footing. We, we do, but we must also not get too overly excited mm -hmm. about it. So I'm always very cautious where we go on about innovation hubs and, mm -hmm. and uh, the cold working spaces. But we must understand that there must be a way to connect this to market. Because mm -hmm. that's really where the real success mm -hmm. exists. And that market includes, uh, if you look at the fintech space, you know, how do we allow the fintech to participate much more across the country? Uh, some of the things I already mentioned in terms of connectivity, skill set, access to finance, uh, and let them scale. You know, how do we even start looking at how do we push solutions across our borders? How do we see Nigerian solutions being used in, in other African countries? That will come as a result of this innovation network that we'll build. Because if you can get some of the successful startups to build solutions that can ride on the back of could it be uh, an enterprise solution provider or just directly because Nigeria is worked successfully in Nigeria? There's no reason why this is not exported as a solution. Okay. So that's the approach. That's where we're looking at. Now, Larry, well, we're just going to take a short break at this point. Thank you for your time so far. We'll come back and continue uh, from where we left the conversation. I'll be speaking to Larry Oshibona. He's a senior special assistant to Nigeria's president on ICT. We're looking at, of course, how Nigeria can further develop uh, the sector. We'll continue our discussion after this short break to join us again. Marcus, if you're just joining us, Larry Oshibana, Senior Special Assistant to Nigeria's President and ICT is our guest today. On Beyond Marketing, we're discussing how Nigeria should position for the opportunities the digital economy brings. Larry, thank you for your time so far. Let's go on to the jobs Thank market. You. We're seeing uh, technology disrupting the labor markets. I mean, f f from the, between the World Bank and the World Economic Forum, uh, the message is, look, Africa has this huge uh, youth population. Between now and you know, by 2050, the distinction will be clear. You know, the African continent versus the other continents. And of course, in Sub-Saharan Africa, skill set within the digital economy is, has to, is a no-brainer. We have to begin to reskill, retool our youth. So I'm just wondering, I mean, going from, I mean, building from the conversation we had about those innovation hubs, ICT, the partnerships, the connections that the government is also helping to facilitate. But what, are you, what is your perspective in terms of how much traction we have right now if one were to count some of those innovation hubs, you could just count them on your fingers. I'm just wondering how, yes, how much more? I'm just wondering, can we pick this, you know, pick up the pace? No, I, I think um, there, there are quite a number of decent innovation hubs uh, and uh, technology parks that, that, that are coming together. Okay. And I think much, 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 much more. I mean, if you think about it versus count. the youth population, I'm just wondering. Because Indeed. Look, many, youth Indeed. Are, many of our youth are still stuck in that, oh, and I go to, I'll go to, you know, go to university, study, maybe. Uh, classics or some, you know, 
uh, discipline that may not you know, be you know, in, in touch with our current realities. And Indeed. they are hoping to Indeed. go into the labor market and get a good job. But that's just not our reality anymore. Indeed. I know I think um, there, there's already heavy conversations ongoing in terms of our education and the curriculum. Uh, if you look at the private schools, I think they are doing very well. If you, in, in fact, we, I, I did some analysis and noticed that a lot of the startups that didn't necessarily come by, that are not your diaspora returnees, you'll find that they were coming from particular institutions. Yeah. So that speaks volume. Um, and I, it, that's, that's, of course, because of the curriculum being uh, taught in those private schools. Government is already working heavily on changing that curriculum. However, uh, again, uh, the, just recently there was a launching for a new technology university that's going to be built that will focus purely on this kind of, um, it's almost like the, I think India has something like MIT, uh, yeah. similar, similar to that, okay. which will create uh, these all new uh, skilled Nigerians. But one, one thing I'm certain is that a whole lot of learnings can be achieved actually through tablets. I've seen developers, of, uh, I know some stories of some developers working with Andela that just picked up these skills just on their own. And this is the beauty of technology. So yes, we must invest in STEM courses in schools, but there are also opportunities for people to pick and learn uh, coding and development and, and development solutions just on the back of having access to, to the tools and the right devices. So the, the multi-pronged approach that we must look at in, uh, doing. One is this digital infrastructure. Have access to the internet. Okay, if I could just come in here, still on education. I asked that question because I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, not too long ago, I had two, uh, the proprietresses of two schools focusing on STEM. Mm. And, you know, during our conversation, I kept asking. So I know that, you know, obviously, government uh, is, is usually, obviously, private sector driven. But what role? What complementary efforts have you had from the government? And they kept saying, look, you know, it's, it's not satisfactory. Yes, every, obviously, government can't do everything. And she, one of them did tell me, give me a story about, she said Boeing, the company Boeing, the play yes. company, you know, is actually, you know, has a project in one of those schools. And they're training these young, as young as seven, eight. Yes. Hoping that, you know, at a time that the time will come when that talent pool mm. will be readily available for mm. them to hire because mm. you've seen the statistics. Yeah. I'm just wondering, we're all looking at these yes. same statistics yes. as a country, as a continent, as, yeah. as, as a global world. Yeah. And some people, some continents, some big companies outside of Africa have already been able to identify potential uh, 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 talent pool. And, it's, and for them, it's long term. 20, they're looking 20, Indeed. 30 years ahead. Are we doing the same thing? Indeed. And, and also, again, you know, there's a MasterCard Foundation that I know very well is looking at Africa, looking to create 30 million jobs in Africa for the next 10 years. Tall order. I think Nigeria, there's a target at 6 million. So the number of private sector and development partners are looking at this. What government must focus on, again, what we are doing as a government, uh, and I'm aware of this conversation, is really a lot is in the hands of the, of the, of the state governors. So what we're looking at is how do we use support grants to, if you meet certain um, criteria as part of di uh, digital investment, you know, all these challenges, right of way, um, digitizing government, um, you know, collecting taxes through, through, through uh, using technology. Okay. Then we're also looking at the federal government to offer some kind of grant. That's a conversation that I'm personally trying to push. Uh, some kind of grant that helps you in achieving those those goals and part of the condition or part of the criteria is that stem courses becomes part of your curriculum in the states i think that that's really but what about as an education policy can we not begin to build that structure make it so 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 the policy is one and, okay. and you're right but it's also the implementation of those policies and most times you have to support the states to implement those policies so right. you know we shouldn't write policies for the sake of writing policy but i agree with you stem courses definitely no, no doubt about it but how do we ensure implementation and you have to deliberately showcase you know support the, the states and showcase the benefits there, thereof but i think again you know, we, we're very eager and we're all very, we're, we're not patient and we're we, so, so rightly so. Because but, but, I mean, just look at it, it it's all moving at lightning speed. Indeed, but <laughs> what, what we must also do is, if you look at a number of the uh, big companies, you know, if you look at Wipro, which is a big technology com uh, company out of India, Wipro started as a palm oil company. If you look at Nokia, which I'm sure you know, Nokia was a timber pulp making company. These are private institutions that follow the trend. One, one of the things I, I'm hoping and already, again, uh, Honorable Minister of Trade and Investment is looking at this. How do we bring the traditional sector 
today, which, you know, oil and gas, people like in, in the cement industry and all, how do we start working closely? Because government can't, you know, literally do all of these things. It's to facilitate. How do we connect these traditional sector leaders with this burgeoning startup ecosystem? Okay. How do we start letting them see the, 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 the benefits? Because a lot of the money that's coming into that space is coming from abroad. But we're losing out as a result in terms of IP, you know, intellectual property. Once we can get the connection to, 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 to work successfully, then the investment will really go in, in terms of you have really big institutions that are private hubs or, or, or innovation hubs or collaborating or collaborating workspaces. And that's, that's really where the effort needs to be. But also we must, and I spoke to this earlier, we must create the opportunity for markets. What you will find is, and I, I tend to say this, what you find is once a lot of success stories are coming out, the individuals will actually search for education. But we must showcase those success stories. So a lot of our effort, apart from the policies, which I, uh, we're doing a lot on, is also the old connecting the different sectors and the different players to really get this force to, to be behind us. Um, I think we, we have starved a bit in terms of the money coming in from, from or into the startup ecosystem. So there's a, the best place, best time that we're looking to put uh, the traditional sector investment in. But also as a government, there's a $500 million innovation fund that we're okay. actually looking to put together. Again, it's to support that ecosystem. And once this funding comes in, for us, we need to retain the skills because actually it's not that we don't have skills. What we have is we have a whole lot of skills going abroad. So it's to look at how do we retain the skills? How do we bring quality jobs, dignified jobs to, into this uh, market? You know, this is by way of outsourcing. Yeah. You know, how do we then have the multiplier effect? Because what it means really is you know, all the jobs won't necessarily be from IT, but what you'll find is the multiplier effect. Because people are earning decently, then they need to have a home. Then they need to have investment, then they can build a place, then they spend money, then there's an economy that grows as a result. And this is also how do we, in, in a diversification effort, how do we move into the other states? I know certain states are doing a whole lot to make themselves really be the one to uh, attract the right investment, attract the right skills. Uh, because again, that, those are the kind of things we need to look at. I know Cardinal is doing fantastically around that. I know Ogun State Governor particularly is very interested. We've seen what the Lagos State Governor is looking to do in Borno. Uh, I found some exciting solutions that's come out of Borno. Uh, people that have built real innovations, people that are really digitizing government. So there are a number of things that are happening. And number, I believe, is also doing quite, quite very well. Edo State is doing extremely very well. You can't get all, all of them at the same time, but, you know, there is progress. What about, and I mean, partnering with business, talking to businesses themselves in terms of, because we know usually there are internships, you know, at some point, you know, within their uh, uni uh, curriculum where, you know, tr tr interns go, interns and even graduates, because many times some companies, yes, a lot of them want to make that investment to train, re to reskill the graduates to fit into the, I mean, what is actually required in today's labor market because universities are not doing uh, yes. enough because obviously they have their own baggage of, you know, issues to funding research and all of that, you know, and et cetera. I don't want us to go into that. But is that something government can also look to having some kind of partnership, some kind of conversation with these businesses, telling them, them that, okay, fine, if you could just help us, you know, help reskill, retool these, these graduates, these, you know, yes. the labor market. Indeed, and there, there, is, there is that program, actually. Our NPower program looks, yeah. looks at that a, a whole lot, you know, from uh, the blue-collar jobs to the white-collar jobs. But particularly, I think if you look at this $500 million innovation fund, that is government's commitment and support into the ecosystem. And that will also attract traditional sector, which I said uh, the Honorable Minister of Trade and Investment is taking as a major uh, commitment to build a whole new industry on the back of the fourth industrial revolution. And once we can successfully attract, as a means of even them diversifying their asset base or their uh, investment into this whole new space, because it is here for, for, for the taking. It is happening and it's going to happen either we're in it or not, so we must be in it. And also, especially, you know, I tend to look at it as the old new, you know, you look back 50 years from now, you wonder if we don't get it right, we'll have really done ourselves and the future. We, we have to, because, injustice. I mean, what's one question every African you know, country is asking themselves now is, are we ready for the fourth industrial revolution? What, are, what have we, what groundwork we, have we put, you know, in place? What we are experiencing the fourth uh, industrial we are, revolution but yes, but right, are we, right what, now. What are we doing to fully harness it? Indeed, indeed. I think uh, from a policy perspective, uh, mm -hmm. and we already actually just uh, a bill that almost went to uh, full uh, accent, uh, looking at the data protection, uh, because again, as we attract 
big international companies, we also must be very careful because data is going to be extremely important. And how do we protect this data? Not necessarily protect it from in terms of access to it, but it's how do we protect the ownership of that data, uh, irrespective of where that data is. So it's not to say we don't want to share data. We definitely will share data, but we want to share it on on, on, on their own terms, on our own terms, and, and, and also the economics of that data, you know. Uh, while rich countries might not be particularly interested in making money out of data, we should make money out of data. Um, for anyone that's um, providing, uh, you know, their information, they can decide to say, you know, if you're going to sell my data or use it for whatever advertisement, I also must partake in, okay. in, 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 in some benefits from that. Larry, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there today. Thank you so much for talking to us today. We appreciate your time Thank on you. the show. I've been speaking to Larry Oshibana. He's a senior special assistant to Nigeria's president on ICT. That's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember that you can watch all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website. That's cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets. And of course, you can send your thoughts, your comments to my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awuni. For myself and the team, it's bye for now. Thank you.